All right, so I wanted to start today by talking uh, about the homework. Uh, I posted a new homework. It's all about hydraulic fracturing field tests. And uh, if you go over here, uh, remember this is going to be due on November 19. I believe that's a Tuesday. No, it's a Monday. Okay? It's a Monday. Are you guys going to be here next week? before Thanksgiving. Raise your hand if you plan not to be here, if you're going somewhere else, during the entire week. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll record my class, so so don't worry if, if, you, if you, you cannot make it. Uh, you'll have access to that. All right, so here what you have to do is you have to solve problems uh, related to hydraulic fracture in field tests. Uh, I cannot emphasize more the, the importance of, of this homework and what we're going to see now, guys. Uh, if you plan to stay in the U.S. and work here, very likely you're going to do some sort of hydraulic fracturing. Uh, so uh, t to me, it, it, it's very important that, that you learn the fundamentals of hydraulic fracturing in this class, so when you go to work at, in some place, you're ready to understand uh, more complex uh, uh, completion procedures and, and you are able to make a difference from the, from the very beginning. So, so this homework is very important, it's very applied, so, so, so make sure you know how to do this very well. And there is here one, one little thing. Uh, that it's uh, going to be very important for solving the homework and uh, also for solving the practical problems in the, in the exam that I want that you understand very well. Uh, first of all, we have a problem about a leak of test. And in, in this leak of test that I took out of, from a paper, uh, you have a schematics very similar to mine, you see. My schematics are not that unrealistic. And you know what is the water depth? You know the depth at which uh, the leak of test was done. Uh, take, take this one, the shoe depth. And here you have the pressure readings of downhole pressure and surface pressure. And this is the small trick where that I was telling you about. What is the difference between downhole pressure and surface pressure? Anyone knows? So a surface pressure is a surface reading, right? You have a gauge which is on surface. And the downhole uh, pressure is something that you either calculate or sometimes you can also measure if you have a transducer uh, at the end of the, of the casing in this case. Most times you read surface pressure because uh, you, you need to do some other things to measure bottom hole pressure. The bottom hole pressure, the down hole pressure, is, that's something that you calculate. And in order to calculate that uh, down hole pressure, uh, you need to add the column of fluid, which is here, applying that fluid pressure. So you measure pressure on the surface, but in addition to get to the, to the depth at which you're actually causing pressurizing a fluid and opening a hydraulic fracture, you have this additional column of fluid. The difference between the downhole pressure and the surface pressure is going to be that additional pressure with that column of fluid. Uh, you know how to calculate very well, right? The additional pressure is just going to be the density of the fluid times depth. So if, say, if you had just the, den the density of a fluid, and it's a fluid which is not very heavy, uh, the maximum pressure that you would apply at the bottom hole will be just the density of the fluid times the depth. In order to apply additional pressure, you need pumps. And those pumps are gonna help you to increase that additional pressure to put more pressure here at the bottom hole. And in order to, uh, when you apply that ad additional pressure, then you measure a nexus surface pressure, right? So you see at the beginning, if you're not applying anything, 
your service pressure is going to be zero. As you start to pump fluids uh, quickly, your surface pressure is going to go up, and of course, your downhole pressure is going to go up too. But remember that at the beginning, the downhole pressure is not zero. Surface pressure may be zero, but downhole pressure is not zero. So that additional difference is going to depend on the density of the fluid. Okay? Yes? Um, what is what is the normal fault in your GV? On C, like, did you, like, is it normal faulting? Ha, huh, I gave you the answer here. <laughs> uh, so uh, the question is uh, meant to be, what is the faulting regime? Okay. <laughs> okay? So, yeah. Uh, but justify, try to understand why that would be, it's actually normal faulting, very likely to be normal faulting. Actually, I don't know in this case, but uh, it's very likely for the, the data that you will see over there that this is a normal faulting, and also because it's, it's in the Gulf of Mexico. So many places over there are in normal faulting. Um, okay, so he, from here you calculate uh, what is, uh, or you get the value of fracture closure pressure. From that you can estimate your minimum principal stress. And from that you can do all of these calculations. Okay? This is a problem of a leak off test uh, done with drilling map. Second one is a problem of a microfrag test. And this microfrag test, I told you that sometimes uh, people use some other more more complex methods in order to solve uh, what is a fracture closure pressure. In this case, I'm asking you to solve this problem with the square root of time method. And this is the method that we discussed last, last uh, Tuesday, and it is this one in which you plot pressure after the instantaneous shedding pressure and you convert uh, that delta t to square root of delta t and you will see that it's going to be a point where there is a clear separation between something that drops very quickly and it's more or less aligned into a line and then it's going to drop uh, more slowly. That's a point, that's a fracture closure pressure. You do not have to point that particular pressure, you know, with an accuracy of plus minus one PSI. Don't worry about that. There is a lot of uncertainty here. Uh, so, so just pick a point that you are happy with and that, that more or less uh, uh, resembles this kind of plot and that, that's going to be fine. And uh, you're gonna have to download a file over here. So that's an Excel file, it's right there. You have time, injection uh, rate, and uh, pressure in that in that file. So here you have something. You have the opposite of what you saw before. The pressure reading that you're going to read from that file it's a surface pressure reading. Okay, but I want you to calculate what is the minimum principal stress. That's the whole objective of, of this kind of test to calculate the minimum principal stress. So in addition to that fracture closure pressure that you measure on surface, you need to add the column of the fluid. And the column of the fluid in this case, uh, you're gonna have to calculate it with this pressure gradient. You add that one to the surface pressure and you get the bottom hole pressure, which is going to be actually your minimum principal stress. This is another DFI test in which you now, uh, given some data, you need to interpret this plot, okay? Uh, so it's not, m many times, especially if you're working on hydraulic fraction, you will see a lot of these uh, tests and a lot of these data. Uh, and from here, you need to be able to interpret quickly uh, what's going on, uh, what is the minimum principal stress from this kind of test. It's also a defeat test. In this case, and I have taken these problems before in, in exams, uh, you, I'm not gonna ask you to calculate exactly uh, the fracture closure pressure by uh, doing a plot of square root with time. You don't have time for that, okay? But 
All I ask in this point is to give an educated guess to more or less where that uh, fracture closure uh, could be. Uh, notice that here we could say instantaneous shutting pressure somewhere over there, and maybe fracture closure pressure somewhere over here or over there, no, very likely not over here. But the uncertainty is just a few hundred PSI. It's actually not a lot. So if you were to say, well, it's somewhere very likely over here, probably that's close to the answer. Probably not very accurate, but close enough for interpreting, uh, for just eyeballing fracture closure pressure from this, from this plot. And the last one is in a step rate test. Uh, for this step rate test, I want you to uh, plot all of these lines, okay? You will see that all of those uh, correspond to an unsteady state process, and at some point, uh, you need to pick a pressure out of that and plot pressure as a function of injection rate, and you'll get the, the solution for the formation part in pressure. So, uh, I know that some of you weren't here on, on Tuesday, but uh, everything you need to solve this homework is on that lecture on Tuesday that I already uploaded on YouTube, all right? Uh, okay, so, any question about the homework? Remember, it's you uh, on, we said, I forgot already, the 19th, okay? Uh, so next Monday, it, it's short, it's short. Uh, it does involve a lot of equations, more like plotting, picking some points, and that, that's it. All right, if there are no questions, uh, let's continue with uh, lectures. So we talked about hydraulic fracturing tests, but uh, we didn't really explain uh, what's going on with hydraulic fracture propagation. Uh, our objective today is going to have a better understanding of how hydraulic fractures propagate, how fast they propagate, and what is the geometry of hydraulic fractures as they uh, propagate. Uh, we will see that hydraulic fracture propagation is actually quite a complex process because it involves uh, many things going at the same time. Uh, and we're going to look at four of them in detail uh, now. So we're going to call this topic uh, couple hydraulic fracture propagation. And in this problem, we are interested in solving the geometry of a hydraulic fracture uh, propagating out of uh, many times of wellbore over perforation. And uh, from that uh, fracture, we're going to assume that we have a relatively simple, simple fracture geometry which is, has two wings, looks like kind of an airplane. This assumption of, of having just a one wing fracture geometry, now it's a little bit challenged, okay? Uh, I'm gonna tell you that from the very beginning, but b before we start into something uh, more complex, uh, let's try to study this simple geometry first. Uh, so for this kind of geometry, uh, if we assume the hydraulic fracture just has uh, two wings, and uh, which it, th this is in three dimensions, right? So this is a plane. This is a plane that it's like this, and extends in this direction perpendicular uh, to the to the paper. Uh, we want to understand many things from here. Uh, probably the most important one is how far hydraulic fracture is going to go. And that's gonna be called uh, the fracture half wing, XF. Uh, if I were to look at a uh, schematic of this uh, fracture wing, let me do it somewhere over here, small. So here I'm looking at the cross section of the fracture. And, and let's assume for now this is a vertical wellbore. If I do a fracture over here and the fracture gets as far as somewhere over there, 
where this is the the pay zone and here I have the cap rock and uh, what is below the, the formation the half wing is going to be this okay so how far the hydraulic fracture gets very important parameter another very important parameter is going to be what is the height of the fracture right something that we cannot see in this plot over here but we, you can see it in this other one here and that's going to go by hf the height of the fracture what could be another parameter which is going to be very important for defining the geometry of the fracture the width and the width notice that is going to vary with position and here I'm going to introduce a coordinate system x y so the width is a function of x it's the highest uh, next to the wellbore and it's zero at the tip of the fracture so this point over here this is called the tip of the fracture uh, notice also that uh, inside the the fracture we have fluids right it's open because we have a fluid uh, inside and that fluid is going to be at a given pressure which is also a function of x it is not constant all along the the fracture actually some of this fluid is moving as the fracture propagates and if it's moving it's because there is a gradient and there is a gradient the pressure is not going to be the same the pressure has to to vary that pressure inside the fracture is going to apply a stress on the wall of the fracture and that stress it's gonna be sigma yy because it's in the direction y <coughs> and it's also gonna be a function of x what what is the minimum possible value for for px well remember that in order to be general uh, there are some fractures uh, in reverse faulting in which the minimum principal stress can be vertical so in this case if this is a vertical well bore and we're assuming normal 14 or strike slip it's going to be sh mean but in general uh, here this fracture is going to open perpendicularly to a far field stress which is s3 right and from here we know that uh, as we discussed last time there is something which is called net pressure and goes by pn which is going to be also a function of x which is going to be equal to the pressure in the fracture minus the minimum principal stress in order to propagate the hydraulic fracture you need a pressure larger than the minimum principal stress how much larger the value of p net and and we would like to calculate that value of, of p net okay all right so uh, we have uh, all the elements that that we need in order to start describing all these uh, coupled uh, processes in the hydraulic fracture first of all in order to solve this problem uh, we need to solve a problem of just mechanics or if we make an assumption uh, it's just going to be uh, with elasticity basically what is going to be the width uh, of the fracture proportional to before we do any numbers we, before we put complex equations uh, what, what would it make sense to you the width is going to be proportional to what so let's say some parameters that we can control it's uh, the pressure in the fracture uh, the rock so all of all of this is rock right all of this is rock the rock is going to have as we have seen 
some properties, some modulus, Poisson ratio, some strength. So what variable you, you can control that you can make the width bigger? The, the pressure. The pressure is going to be one of the main variables. So the bigger the pressure, the bigger the width. Uh, but notice that this is also, uh, this width is going to be inversely proportional to the yam modulus because the stiffer the rock, the more pressure I need to open this uh, fracture. Uh, this is sort of like a spring. You can imagine this as springs over here. The stiffer these springs are, and that's the yam modulus, the more difficult it is to open this fracture. Uh, and if the, the rock is very stiff, it's actually, it requires a lot, lot of pressure to open this fracture. So, uh, but with some pressure, you're gonna be able to uh, overcome that, but the width is usually going to be very small. <coughs> and it's proportional to pressure, inversionally proportional to the, the yam modulus. If you wanted to solve this problem of uh, what is the width as a function of pressure, uh, it's actually it's going to take some time. We're going to talk about that a, a little bit later on, but but this is basically just a problem of continuum mechanics. If you remember the questions that we have seen, that strain depends on the stiffness and uh, apply stress. Well, just use that and you use some of the questions that we have seen before and you solve the problem. But the imp this is the important thing, that the width depends on pressure and it's inversely proportional to, to the YAM modules. Okay, let, let's say that we solve the problem. Of we, kn we know how to calculate width as a function of pressure and as a function of YAM modules. Uh, the second part of this problem is a problem of fluid mechanics now. This one be was about solid mechanics. The second part is about fluid mechanics. Uh, so basically, uh, what we want to solve here is what is the rate of fracturing fluid as it goes through the fracture as a function of pressure. Uh, you can simplify this problem uh, by saying that this is very similar, and actually this, to fluid be between parallel plates. So uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, when you did fluids, you revise the equation for laminar flow in a tube, and also for laminar flow <coughs> between two parallel plates. Well, this case is very close to that one, okay? Where the fluid is going in this direction. And the equation for that says that the flow rate is going to be proportional to what What do you think the variables are going to be? What is going to be the flow rate proportional to? Pressure. Pressure. Uh, so I'm going to put here delta P. What else? So gradient of pressure, right? Not, not just absolute pressure, but gradient of pressure. Viscosity. But that's going to go over here, inversion proportional yeah. to viscosity. And uh, what else? The, the absolute flow rate also is going to depend on the height of the fracture. The bigger the fracture, uh, the higher the amount of flow that is going to go through that section. And what is going to be another very important parameter here? Notice that this is a function of x. What did we say also was a function of x? No. Look at my pinky finger. The width. The width. And it makes a lot of sense, right? And actually, if you remember the theory of flow between plates, uh, this one goes to the cube. So the bigger the width, the more the flow uh, rate uh, is going to be, the higher the flow rate is going to be. Uh, but notice that now, this flow rate is linked to that width, and this width depends on pressure, but pressure is also here. So if you want to solve this problem together, uh, you're going to have to solve those two equations together. 
that's what uh, we say it's a couple problem because one depends on the other okay um, so this this is just fluid mechanics if you assume laminar flow it's e easy to solve and uh, well in this case also we're assuming a Newtonian fluid so uh, this is going to be laminar flow let's see what else is going on into the fracture um, we're not dealing with uh, solids that uh, have zero permeability <coughs> that have zero porosity we are dealing with solids that actually have pores and those pores uh, they take some fluid and that's gonna produce some leak off so that's something else to consider and it's not only the leak off but also we want to make sure that amount of fluid that we inject here at, at the wellbore and we're going to call that parameter i uh, it uh, we don't know if it's going to go in the wellbore or i'm sorry if it's going to go into the fracture or into the leak off we, we want to know that what proportion of the injected fluid uh, goes into the fracture and which one goes into the formation so uh, for that we call those equations material balance um, basically the amount of injected volume is going to be equal to the volume that goes into the fracture plus the volume that goes into uh, leak off. Uh, for this leak off, so le let me add some. This goes into the fracture. This is total injected, and this is leak off. Uh, for this leak off. Uh, some equations that are very popular it's uh, one which is called the Carter equation <coughs> that it basically says the volume of leak off uh, is proportional to the area of leak off it makes a lot of sense right and that depends on a leak off co coefficient this coefficient CL which is called also the Carter leak off parameter depends on time this is a time dependent process and uh, also depends on an amount which is called the spurt loss the mud cake takes some time to form so before the mud cakes form usually you have some filtration which is higher than what you would have after the mud cake formed and that's called the spurt loss uh, but this is just basically an equation to compute leak off so if you wanted to uh, put all these equations together you're gonna need an equation for the for the leak off uh, volume uh, there is another uh, very important parameter here that uh, that we can consider and it's called a parameter called the efficiency of the injected volume and it goes by eta and this relates the amount of volume that goes into the fracture divided the total amount of injected volume basically as eta tends to one you will say this is a, a high efficiency hydraulic fracture because almost all of your fluid goes into the into the fracture if eta is very small uh, you will say that that's a low efficiency or that you have a significant leak off sometimes a lot of leak off is not good uh, because it you have the same problem as in wellbore uh, when you drill a wellbore when you drill a wellbore and you have your drilling mud that filtrates into your basin that's going to cause what let's say that you have a very nice reservoir with uh, <coughs> 80%, 70% oil saturation, and now you display some of that oil with uh, mud filtrate. What's going to happen? Uh, 
you're going to have lots, lots of water now, and your relative permeability for oil is going to be very low. That's, that's formation damage. In unconventionals, also, that's a big problem because you, you can inject uh, a lot of uh, water in it, and if it imbibes in the formation, it's going to damage the permeability near the fracture. And if you damage that permeability, your production is not going to be as good as if you weren't uh, having that damage. Okay, so um, how do we couple now this with time? Yes, Mr. Ewan. It takes some, but, but not everything. But initially, uh, your initial flow rates may be, may be pretty low. And that, that's, that's an issue. Um, all right, so how do we couple this with time? <coughs> the total uh, injected volume. That's going to depend on the injection schedule. And uh, injection schedule usually varies with time. Uh, I'm going to come back to this later on. But for now, uh, we're just going to assume that uh, a particular case, which is constant injection rate, and in this case, the injected volume is just going to be equal to the injection rate times time. Very simple, right? Uh, so uh, these two are linearly related. The injected, the volume injected, and the injection rate. Something very important here, this parameter i is just for one wing. Many of our computations, we're just gonna do it for one wing. So if you wanna know what is the total injection rate, you need to multiply this number by two, okay? Um, okay, so uh, l let's come back over here. <coughs> Notice that in order to propagate this fracture, we need energy. That energy comes from the pressure of the fluid. Uh, that pressure of the fluid opens the fracture, deforms the rock. That pressure of the fluid and the gradient makes the fluid flow through the fracture. And that same pressure of the fluid makes the fluid get into the formation and leak off into the formation. When there is leak off, there is going to be viscous losses by that fluid getting into the formation, right? That's when you, there you're going to get into uh, fluid flow in porous media. So all of that requires energy. And all of that requires the net pressure to be a value that's gonna be higher than the minimum principal stress. How higher? It depends how much you have to deform the rock, uh, how much energy you need to make the fluid to go from here to the tip, and also how much fluid is getting uh, lost into the formation. There is one more thing that we need to consider in order to have a complete uh, analysis of this coupled uh, fracture propagation problem. Can you see which one that is? Something we didn't, we didn't talk about yet. When you're opening a hydraulic fracture, what, what's, go what's happening to the rock? Hmm? Undergoing tensile, failure. tensile failure, right? So notice that this is just the pressure to keep it open. But we didn't talk about the energy needed actually to propagate this fracture, to cause that tensile failure at the tip of the fracture. And also that requires some energy. If the fracture is very tough, if the rock is very tough, uh, that's going to require a lot of energy. Usually when fractures are short, at the beginning of a hydraulic fracture propagation too, uh, there's going to be a lot of more energy that goes into starting the fracture. So here, you're going to cause tension. And fracture propagation in this uh, case is going to depend on, this is also going to be stress sigma yy is going to depend on something which is called the toughness of the rock. And this is a new concept that we haven't seen so far. Uh, so the fourth problem, 
uh, additional problem that we have to solve and put into our equation is the creation of new surface that takes uh, energy and uh, we're going to solve this let me underline all of these topics we're going to solve this with the theory of linear elastic fracture mechanics we haven't seen this so far but it's not too difficult to understand basically uh, what we're going to say is that the rock has something which is called a given toughness and we're going to run an experiment today to measure <coughs> that toughness that toughness goes by k and usually when we refer to tensor fractures it goes by ki is the the toughness uh, or the intensity factor uh, in uh, in open mode fracture and that intensity depends on the net pressure depends on the Young modulus and the elastic property of the rock and it also depends on the length of the fracture so let, let me I'm, I'm getting ahead here of what I want to say this is called stress intensity factor and what we're going to say is that if the stress intensity factor is higher than the limit stress intensity factor of the rock now which this one is called fracture toughness if this is true then we have fracture propagation otherwise there is no fracture propagation so uh, it's, it's, it's not granted that the fracture is going to propagate ahead from the very beginning you need to overcome this rock fracture toughness uh, for that fracture uh, to propagate so um, th this part is very important guys and usually I always take it in the exam okay uh, all these four processes that contribute to hydraulic fracturing all of them are equally important <coughs> yes Mr. what's the subscript for the fracture toughness K KIC so this uh, K uh, uh, capital I K capital I uh, C so that value which it depends so this one depends on the fracture geometry this one depends on the rock properties um, so thi this these four uh, processes are, are super important and we're going to get back to those and we're going to see how those uh, are useful in, in our equations now i like to talk about this new thing about fracture toughness okay and we're going to see what what that is <coughs> and i'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about this theory of fracture mechanics what time is it jeffrey is supposed to show up soon okay all right so uh, this problem is called uh, the Griffith line crack problem and uh, this guy Griffith solved the equations of linear elasticity with very complex uh, equations and integrals in order to solve what are the stresses at the tip of a fracture basically we're interested in a problem in which we have a fracture which is a very thin and we're just going to draw as a line and that fracture it's opening perpendicular to the far field stress s3 and inside has a pressure uh, p it's called a pf for that fracture to open uh, the pressure inside here has to be higher than the far field 
uh, stress, right? Otherwise, it, it wouldn't open. And in all these cases in which we have linear elasticity, uh, we can assume that this is equivalent to having no far field stress and just having in that fracture something which is going to be what? You should, you know this by now. It's just a net pressure. So net pressure, remember, very important equation to remember, very easy to remember too, is going to be the pressure in the fracture minus the minimum principal stress. Uh, you, you can come in, Jeffrey, and start setting up the the low frame. I uh, I think I think we have some uh, we have a power outlet over here. So just go ahead and get everything started till I get over there. Okay. <coughs> so uh, what uh, what Griffith did uh, was to solve this problem uh, and to find out what would be the displacement inside the fracture and also the stresses in the tip of the fracture. So now if I draw this again and, and this is the line crack what uh, Griffith predicted is that the deformation of, of this line crack when you apply a pressure inside is going to look like an ellipse so the opening and it makes sense, right? The opening is going to be the highest at the center. It's going to be zero at the tips. This fracture is not propagating. And we're going to call uh, this going to be uh, a coordinate system where this is x, this is y. Uh, a displacement here is going to be u, y. And Griffith solved that UI inside the line crack uh, is going to look, it's going to depend on the pressure inside. And I'm going to do one more assumption here that PN is equal to P0 and is constant. Uh, that's how we get these equations. Uh, it's going to be inversion proportional to the plane strain modulus uh, I'm going to you remember probably hopefully you remember what that is and it looks like an ellipse where C is the half length of the fracture and E this is the plane strain modulus is equal to E divided 1 minus uh, Poisson ratio squared so now we have an equation for what we said before, right? Displacement proportional to pressure, inversion proportional, proportional to the Young modulus, and also it depends on the length. It is, <coughs> look, if x is equal to c, then the, the displacement is going to be zero. And if x is equal to zero, the displacement is going to be the maximum. From this equation two, at uh, x equal to, to zero, we can compute the width. The width of the fracture at x equal to zero is going to be two times the displacement. And that's going to be equal to four <coughs> uh, p zero times the half length divided the plane strain modulus. OK, so now we know what is the shape of the fracture. Uh, what we want to compute now is what is the stress at the tip of the fracture? What is this sigma yy? And Griffith also found the solution for that. And uh, the solution for that, let me extend this over here and where this is x this is C. Uh, first of all, before we put any equations, is that going to be a tensile stress or a compression stress? Mm. 
So I have a, I have pressure inside the fracture. Uh, notice that in order to balance all that pressure inside, this section has to be all in tension. Uh, the thing is how far that tension goes. Uh, so uh, that's what we want to calculate. And here I'm going to put sigma yy. This is going to be a tension. And, and Griffith solved that as the closer you get to the tip, the higher that tension is going to be. And actually, he shows that that value tends to infinity, which is something that uh, we cannot deal with mathematically. So we need to, to find a way around that. And that, that's what we're going to do in, in a bit. Uh, the equation of, of Griffith uh, is that sigma yy uh, is going to be equal to, depends on the pressure inside the fracture, and also has some sort of uh, power decay minus 1. And this is valid for uh, x that is equal or greater than c. And uh, let me ask you, what is going to be sigma yy at uh, inside inside the fracture, all over here? Any any guess? Just by equilibrium, uh, somewhere over here. What is the reaction that you need in the rock uh, at that point for that to be equ at equilibrium? Any guess? So this one is going to be a tension inside the fracture. This is going to be a compression. And th that compression is going to be just the value of the pressure uh, inside the fracture. So this is going to be a compression. And this is going to be valid for x, which is between uh, 0 and z. Um, All right, so um, we have a problem now. Uh, and our problem is that uh, we're saying that the stress, the tension stress is infinity at the tip of the fracture. And <coughs> what, what that would mean is that all rocks, that we know they have a finite tensile stress. So the all rocks should break according to this theory. Uh, and, uh, and and that's not true because you, we know that sometimes we can have a fracture. You can apply pressure inside; and it's not going to propagate. So, in order to deal with with this problem, uh, we're going to define something uh, which is called, uh, as we said before, a stress intensity factor. And that stress intensity factor, uh, by definition, is the limit. You guys remember limits? This is an application of limits. It's an application uh, in which uh, the it's going to be the limit of the stress as you approach to this point. And in this case, this is going to be R, as R tends to 0 of, by definition, 2 pi R square root times sigma yy. Uh, that's a definition of stress intensity. So notice that as you get to the tip of the fracture, r tends to 0, and sigma yy tends to infinity. What is 0 times infinity? You, ca you cannot do that, right? Wh wh what, what did you say? 
No, no, you, you cannot do that. You cannot really uh, multiply zero times infinity. Uh, so, uh, but you can take a limit. And, and this, this is the beauty of this equation that you will tend to a finite number when you take that limit. And uh, the solution for that, uh, for a constant pressure fracture, is going to be that the intensity is equal to the pressure inside the fracture times pi times the half length of the fracture square root of all of that. This is for constant pressure. So it's a finite number. And it we can also calculate this stress intensity value if we don't have a constant pressure. Uh, we may have sometimes uh, pressure that as we say before, varies with uh, with the length of the fracture, so it's not going to be constant. But what we wanted to do is, uh, we know how to calculate now this one. Griffith can tell us uh, at least an approximation of that for a, a constant pressure fracture. What we want to do now is to see what is the fracture toughness of the rock. And that is what we're going to do now uh, with Jeffrey, okay? So, so Jeffrey's gonna show us uh, how to run this uh, test and l let me give you a very short introduction to that. We're going and you have to report this in a in a lab report. Okay, it's not going to go into the homework like we did before. This is going to be a lab report. Uh, this is called semicircular bending test. or sometimes SCB, semicircular bending. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to subject a piece of rock, which is a half cylinder, to a state of stress so that we cause propagation from a tip. Here, we're going to apply a load on the top uh, which is going to we're going to call it P the width of the rock is going <coughs> to be L the radius of the cylinder is going to be R and the length of the tip is going to be A the distance between the tip and the reaction force in this case is going to be S here th these are rollers uh, so you're going to see those rollers in a bit so that when we apply the force the fracture can propagate very nicely this one is going to roll to the sides and the fracture toughness in this case is going to be approximately equal to the maximum force times pi a so this is very similar to the equation that that we saw before divided 2 times r l times a coefficient that depends on geometry and in our case according to the settings that we have is more or less equal to 5 okay so, let's run that test. Um, let me see if uh, I think we... I, I, I need several volunteers here. So, let me stop this. <coughs> Sorry. 